Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to continue our survey of the divided kingdom of Judah and Israel in our ongoing survey of ancient history as a framework for the Bible. In 852 BC, there was a well-known battle uh, on the Orontes River in Syria, known as at a place called Karkar. Uh, it's not mentioned in the Bible, neither Karkar, I'm not sure that Karkar is mentioned, at least this battle is not mentioned. Uh, like I said, it's, it, was, it took place in 852 B.C., but it's significant to ancient history because it was a coalition of nations against the Assyrians, and it included Aram and Israel. On the side of Israel, it actually, uh, one of the kings that's mentioned there in the, in the inscriptions is King Ahab of Israel. Now, we saw last time that Elijah had been given a prophecy that God was going to move, and he was instructed to, uh, Elijah was instructed to anoint uh, Hazael as the new king over Aram, and Jehu as the new king over Israel, and Elisha as the prophet to replace Elijah. But that didn't take place immediately. That's only promissory. It would be quite some time before these things were fulfilled. In the case of Hazael, uh, that was with an outlook to international politics. Uh, with regard to Jehu, that was with regard to the national politics there of Israel. Uh, with Elisha, uh, that was with regard to the spiritual leadership of the nation. So what we noted is that we have one non-Israelite <laughs> anointed, and then w the other two, of course, were, were Israelites. The story continues. Ahab's still the king, and he comes back after, I'm assuming it was after the Battle of Karkar, uh, but he comes back to Israel, and um, he notices in Jezreel, his capital, that's where he, this is where he has his palace, uh, you know, probably his winter palace where it's a bit more comfortable. Uh, you don't want to be in the, in the mountains in the wintertime because it's a little bit too chilly. Uh, and he has a neighbor by the name of Naboth with whom he is not going to act very neighborly. Na and Naboth has a vineyard, and Ahab begins to covet it, and it just begins to attract all of his attention, because Naboth doesn't want to sell it. Uh, and Jezebel, Ahab's Phoenician wife, says, look, you're not acting very kingly. A king would just go in and, and figure out some way to take it. And she arranges Naboth to be brought up on false charges and put to death, so that Ahab could steal his vineyard. Uh, and that injustice is just a picture of the overall ungodliness and injustice uh, that this couple are reflecting upon the nation. Ahab comes to his end, and it's prophesied by God, and sure enough it takes place, where he goes into battle and a stray arrow happens to catch him and, and he dies of a rather ignoble death. Their son, Ahaziah, and there's going to be a few of these, so we're going to have to get uh, very particular. The son of Jezebel and Ahab, Ahaziah, now becomes king. And God brings his judgment in early in 2 Kings, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, against Ahaziah. Uh, this begins where Moab rebels. Moab was the country to the south of the Arnon River on the southeast side of the Dead Sea. Um, and Israel, it was not part of Israel, but it, it, it bordered Israel, and Israel up to this point had uh, exercised some influence over Moab, but now Moab rebels. Uh, the term Moab <laughs> actually means my father. Uh, remember, Ab is the word for father. Uh, and these were the descendants of Lot, along with Ammon. Uh, and as we said, these were the, the lands to the south of the Arnon River. One of the inscriptions that we have is known as the Mishastel, or the Moabite stone. And uh, this stone was found in 1868 at Debon in modern day, what we call Jordan today. Uh, and it starts off, I am Misha, son of Kamush. And it tells the story of what we see in earl the early chapters of 2 Kings, especially 2 Kings chapter 3. Uh, of God's judgment uh, against the nation of Israel. The second part of that judgment now takes place in 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 2, where the king, King Ahaziah, falls through a lattice 
uh, and is severely injured. Uh, Ahaziah fell through the lattice in his upper chamber, which was in Samaria, became ill, so he sent messengers and said to them, Go inquire of Baal-zebub, the god of Ekron, where, whether I will recover from this sickness. Now, Baal is the word for Lord, but Baal-zebub, literally Lord of the Fly. Somebody actually wrote a book called that. didn't have anything to do uh, with uh, the events here in in 2 Kings chapter 1 verse 2 except to say things were bad uh, but that had become a sort of a, a byword uh, to describe one of the false gods uh, from the land of the Philistines uh, and so he's going to inquire of this pagan god about his recovery well the messengers returned to him and he said why have you returned and they said to him a man came up to meet us and said to us, Go return to the king who sent you, and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Therefore you shall not come up from the bed where you have uh, gone up, but you will surely die. He said to them, What kind of man was he who uh, came up to meet you and spoke these words to you? And they answered him, He was a hairy man. <laughs> Sort of a uh, interesting description, a uh, Ish Baal Se'ar, a uh, a lordly man of hair, or I guess he, that's one way of uh, describing it. Uh, but literally, it means a it means a hairy man with a leather girdle bound about his loins, and and he said, "Well, that's the description of Elijah the Tishbite." Uh, so Ahaziah died according to the word of the Lord which Elisha had spoken. And because he had no son, Jerob uh, Jehoram became king in his place in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. It sounds a little bit like double talk. It's not. We have one Jehoram that's reigning in Israel, and at the same time we have another Jehoram, son of Jehoshaphat in Judah. So we have two kings by the same name, one in Israel, one in Judah. That can be a little bit, you know, confusing. So we have to, we have to look to see when we read that king where he is from. Uh, Elijah, as we pointed out, uh, he is caught up to heaven around this time, and now Elisha uh, takes up the ministry and continues it. He is now going to be the spokesman of God. We saw Je uh, Jehoram. And uh, now we have another marital alliance that takes place where we have Ahaziah, he's died, Jehoram, or here I've put his name as Joram. We, you, can be, you can read uh, both spellings, uh, both in the English text and even in the Hebrew text, sometimes just to, sti to distinguish it uh, from Jehoram of Judah. And then to make matters more confusing, uh, Jehoram of Israel, or Joram of Israel, his sister Athaliah marries Jehoram of Judah. And so we're going to have a marital alliance which will produce offspring that will be descendants of both the king of Israel and the king of Judah. Well, Elijah, Elisha the prophet called one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, Gird up your loins, take this flask of oil in your hand, and go to Ramoth Gilead. Ramoth Gilead's on the, remember when you, whenever you see Gilead, that's on the east side of the Jordan River. Uh, he goes to Ramoth Gilead. And when you arrive there, search out Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go in and bid him arise from among his brothers and bring him to an inner room. And there take the flask of oil and pour it on his head, saying, This says, Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. And then open the door and flee and do not wait. So, again, this is going to be a promissory thing, but now it takes place, and Jehu is anointed to be king over Israel. Well, Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Joram, now that he's been anointed, now that he's in on the plan. And Joram, with all Israel, was defending Ramoth Gilead against Hazael, king of Aram. There's, there's already a conflict going on. But King Joram had returned to, to Jezreel to be healed of the wounds which the Aramans had inflicted on him when he fought with Hazael, king of Aram. He's, he was wounded in battle. He's convalescing back in 
in Jezreel. So Jehu said, if this is your mind, then let no one escape or leave the city to go tell it in Jezreel. And so um, we have, we're going to have Jehu going, leaving the campaign in Ramoth Gilead, and he's going to go back to Jezreel, and he does so. Now the watchman was standing on the tower in Jezreel, and he saw the company of Jehu as he came, and said, I see a company, and Joram said, well, take a horseman and send him to meet them, and, and let him say, is it peace? And that's another way of saying, is it well? Is everything okay? Uh, the watchman reported, he came even to them, and he did not return. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, maybe at Leadfoot, for he drives furiously. Uh, then Joram said, well, get ready. And they made a chariot ready. And Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, went out, each in his chariot, both of these kings, because now they're, they're brothers-in-law. Uh, they both went out, each in their chariots. They went out to meet Jehu, found him in the property of all places of Naboth the Jezreelite, that same one who had been uh, put to death unfairly. They're in the property of Naboth the Jezreelite. And Jehu drew his bow with his full strength and shot Joram between his arms. And the arrow went through his heart and he sank in his chariot. When Ahaziah, king of Judah, saw this, he fled by the way of the garden house and Jehu pursued him and said, shoot him too in the chariot. So they shot him at the ascent of Gur, which is at Abliim. But he fled to Megiddo and died there. Notice a death at Megiddo. We're going to see this as sort of a commonality. This isn't the first time we're going to see a, a king of Judah dying at Megiddo. So he chases him to Eblaim, but he, the king of Judah makes it to Megiddo, and there he dies. What we've done is we've gotten rid of Ahaziah. He has died. When Jehu came to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it. She's still living. And she painted her eyes and adorned her head and looked out the window. As Jehu entered the gate, she, says, is it, she said, Is it well, Zimri, your master's uh, murderer? And he lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? And two or three officials looked down. And he said, Throw her down. They threw her down. And some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses. And he trampled her underfoot. He goes in to eat his meal. He says, Well, I probably ought to bury her. Goes back out. And the dogs have eaten her. A very, uh, a very judgmental death. Now, Jehu's eradication of Baal worship now takes place. He calls for a Baal festival with the pronouncement, uh, hey, Ahab served Baal just a little bit. I'm going to serve him a whole lot. And so he calls all of the priests of Baal to come in. Uh, he gathers the priests and the worship, worshipers of Baal into a temple, uh, and then he orders everybody in the temple to be killed. And so the the nation of Israel is no longer going to worship Baal. They are going to turn back to the Lord. The house of Baal is turned into a latrine and there's a call to come back to the Lord. We read in 2 Kings 10.28, thus Jehu eradicated Baal out of Israel. However, as for the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which made Israel sin, from these, Jehu did not depart, even the golden calves that were at Bethel and that were at Dan. So he says, we're not going to worship Baal anymore, but we're going to go back to the good old days, and we're still going to worship God by using these golden calves at Bethel and at Dan. Because we've been doing that a long time. It's part of our tradition, and we don't want to mess up our tradition. Well, Hezael defeated them throughout the territory of Israel from Jordan from the Jordan eastward. So what happens is that Israel has gotten rid of that king, 
But the eastern part of Israel, remember the part that was originally taken by those two and a half tribes, Reuben and Gad and half tribe of Manasseh, who said, we don't want to cross over the Jordan River. That part is captured by the king of Aram, by Hazael. What we, the country we call it Syria today, but they called it Aram back then. And, and we're going we're gonna to continue with that practice or refer to it as Aram. So Israel has, has just gotten quite a bit smaller. Now, we have during this uh, period a obelisk. It um, uh, commemorates Shalmaneser III. He's king of Assyria. And it was discovered by Asa and Henry Laird in 1848 uh, in modern-day Iraq. Uh, it lists military campaigns and tributes that were paid, uh, both in the cuneiform writing below, and then it gives pictures of certain events. Uh, on this obelisk. It includes a panel regarding Jehu, this same Jehu was, who was now king of the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, it has Jehu, and, and Jehu is the one who's kneeling before the Shalmaneser III, king of Assyria, um, paying him servitude. So we've had an end of the third dynasty, and Jehu has brought that end. But notice we've nearly had an end also to the dynasty of Judah. He, his attack uh, ended up bringing a halt to killed both of those kings. And so he's going to rule the northern kingdom of Israel. And the southern kingdom of Judah for a time now is going to be ruled by Athaliah, she is the one who had been the wife of Jehoram. And so we had Ahaziah killed. Athaliah is still surviving. And she goes out and she kills all of her own royal offspring. Anybody associated with that line of the tribe of David. She has them all murdered. Because she wants to have a purely Phoenician, none of this half Jewish, half, half uh, Phoenician. She wants to have a purely Phoenician line upon the throne. But one child escapes, the little child Joash. And he's hidden, and when, he, at the, when he's seven years old, he's brought out into public, and Athaliah is killed and put aside. So the royal offspring had been killed. In fact, the seed of David had been all but obliterated, save one child that was spared. So now we're going to have Jehoash. Now, the beginning of his reign, he's only seven years old, so he, he's actually uh, his uh, guardian, one of the priests, is sort of watching over things. But eventually he's going to reign in his own right, and he will now take up that line of the kingship of Judah. Jehoash um, initially starts off with some reforms. Uh, as his uncle is guiding him, uh, money is taken out of the hands of the priesthood, and there's a system of financial accountability that is instituted, and construction crews are paid out of these funds so that the temple can be restored. It's reflective of this period that an interesting artifact has come to light. Uh, now, Joash is not named in the artifact. It's, even though we call it the Joash inscription, uh, he's nowhere named. But it's implied that it's during his period and under his authority. Reportedly, this artifact was discovered at an illegal excavation of the Temple Mount. What happened is, is um, the the... Uh, Palestinian authorities were actually uh, doing an illegal excavation. They were using bulldozers to just clear out some area. Uh, and then uh, treasure hunters went into the rubble that they had made and sort of sifted through it and supposedly found this tablet. Now, uh, there has been uh, some questioning as to its authenticity. 
And some folk have felt that, uh, no, it's just a forgery, and maybe it is. Um, it's hard to say about such things. Um, because it wasn't discovered as part of an archaeological dig, um, its, it's uh, countenance is a bit unproven. Well, we read in 2 Kings 12.17 that Hazael king of Aram went up and fought against Gath and captured it, and Hazael set his face to go up to Jerusalem. He's bypassed Israel, and he's coming up against Jerusalem now. And Jehoash, king of Judah, took all of the sacred things that Jehoshaphat and Jehoram and Ahaziah, his father's kings of Judah, had dedicated, even his own sacred things, and all the gold that was found among the treasuries of the house of the Lord and of the king's house and sent them to Hazael king of Aram and he went away from Jerusalem. In other words, he bought him out. He bribed him. Uh, Please take all the goods. There is no reason for you to capture Jerusalem because we're giving everything that's not nailed down and just go away. It speaks of the weakness of Judah. Uh, after Jehoash, we're going to see Amaziah. And meanwhile, Jehu now has set up a dynasty. His, after his death, his son Jehoahaz uh, comes to the throne. Uh, and then we're going to have, notice, uh, Jehu, Jehoahaz, and Jehoash. There's, just like we had uh, two Jehorams, we're also, we have also two kings named Jehoahash. Uh, Jehoash. Uh, now, Jehoash is also called Joash at times. Uh, the one that's in Judah. But again, there can be a little bit of confusion as uh, we always ask, ask uh, of what kingdom is he, is he reigning so as not to confuse these two kings. That fourth dynasty continues in the northern kingdom of Israel now with Jeroboam II. And it's under Jeroboam II that Israel is going to have to experience a return of its vitality and it will see Israel at its strongest during this period that, it, that she has been in a long time. Um, now, it's during this period that we read of Jonah. Uh, remember, Jonah is sent to Nineveh, to the capital city of the Assyrians, who are known for their terror tactics. They are known for... Uh, putting fish hooks through the lips of their enemies, uh, taking their captives, skinning them alive, playing games to see how long they can keep uh, that captive screaming in agony. Uh, they depict on their own palace walls uh, a form of impalement and or, I guess you could call it, crucifixion. Uh, again, on their palace walls, we see images of a collection of heads, only heads, but do we see them cutting off arms and legs and hands and and decorating cities with the skulls and heads of their captives. Uh, in a age and place that was known for its cruelty, the Assyrians had a reputation for being especially cruel. Now, it's during that time that Jonah has his ministry, and we also read about Jeroboam II, that it's during this time, that he restored the border of Israel from the entrance of Hamath as far as the Sea of the Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, which is the God of Israel, which he spoke through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, that's the same Jonah that had gone for his submarine ride and then had gone to Nineveh, uh, the prophet who was of gath Hefer. So this same Jonah uh, had prophesied in Nineveh and remember the people of Nineveh, from the king on down, had repented and turned to the Lord. Now, in their repentance, I don't know if this is connected or not, but it's interesting to note that historically, uh, the king of Assyria ended up coming and attacking the enemies of Israel, so that as a result, Jeroboam II is going to be able to extend extend his boundary all the way to Hamath, uh, his influence, that he will uh, be the suzerain, uh, he will be over Damascus and Hamath, uh, and this is Israel at its strongest. Now, it is at this time that we see Jonah, but it's also at this time that we see prophets like Hosea and Amos, 
in Amos, uh, he speaks of the the social injustice of the rich, how they are uh, lying upon beds of ivory, and we t almost take that as a euphemism, you know, a figure of speech, until uh, we actually found a bed frame made of ivory <laughs> in the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, we also have a seal that's come down to us. It says in in Hebrew, Shema, servant of Jeroboam, seems to be Jeroboam the second, that is in view here. Jeroboam's line comes to a quick end when uh, his son is put to death and a, a would-be usurper named Shalom comes to the scene. He doesn't last very long. He's succeeded by Menahem, and Menahem himself doesn't last very long. He's succeeded by Pekiah. And he's also overthrown. That's just the, you know, it's, you have a very quick succession of would-be assassins and, and those who are take, each trying to grab the kingdom. And finally, we have uh, Pekah, who takes the kingdom and who establishes, I suppose it's going to be very short, but we'll refer to that, I suppose, as a fifth dynasty. Now, in the days of Pekah, king of Israel, Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, came and captured Ijan and Abel-Beth-Machaah and Janoa and Kadesh and Hatsor and Gilead and Galilee. In other words, pretty much everything um, that surrounded just the core of Israel, all of these extensive lands, in all the land of Naphtali, and he carried them captive to Assyria. So we've gone from Israel from being at its greatest under Jeroboam, now to just a shadow of her former self, all at the hands of the Assyrians. Notice all of these kings, and of course Damascus had already been uh, lost, and all of these cities, both Gilead and also these cities to the north in the area that we know as Galilee. It's striking that Isaiah around this time speaks of those who dwelled in darkness one day in the future, not yet, but one day in the future they're going to see a great light. And of course he's speaking ultimately of a ministry that would take place in Galilee far in the future. He's speaking of the ministry of Jesus. But these, thing, these cities of Aijan and Abel, Beth, Ma'akah and Genoa and Hetzor and Kadesh, uh, all these are taken away into captivity. Gilead also is lost. Uh, and all of Galilee has been lost to the Assyrians. Now, we have also from the annals of Tiglath-Pileser, not only those cities, but also Megiddo is also taken. Uh, Dor is also taken along the coast. Afek is also taken. And Gaza, Gaza is mentioned in our biblical account, is also taken. We have Pekka, as I said, it's not going to be a very long dynasty. Uh, his comes to an end, and now Hosea, uh, he's going to be the last king of Israel. And he reigns from 732 to 721, and then he will, when he meets his end, Israel in the north will cease to exist. This was the ministry of of uh, Hosea and Amos. Uh, meanwhile in the south we have King Ahaz. He's specifically mentioned in uh, both in the book of 2 Kings but also in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah has a prophecy about uh, this actually directed to Ahaz. Isaiah, Mike is a contemporary of Isaiah. Uh, there's a section where uh, we're not sure if Isaiah is quoting Micah or Micah is quoting uh, Isaiah, but they, like Isaiah chapter um, chapter 2 and also Micah chapter 4, uh, there's a part, part where they both speak of the mountain of the Lord, how it will be established, uh, and it's identical. 
in the in these times in the days of Ahaz in the south Samaria is conquered by the Assyrians you go to Samaria today you do not find a city you just find rubble in the ninth year of Hosea the king of Assyria captured Samaria and carried Israel into exile to Assyria and settled them in Hala and Habor on the river of Gozarks and in the cities of the Medes. So they settled them not in Assyria, but they settled uh, these lost tribes. They're not really lost. They knew where they were at. But these captured tribes, they taken away into captivity uh, to the east of Assyria in the land of the Medes. Now this came about, we read, because the sons of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up from the land of Egypt, from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and they had feared other gods and walked in the customs of the nations whom the Lord had driven out before the sons of Israel, and in the customs of the kings of Israel, which they had introduced. Now it's in this time that we read of Hezekiah and his reformation. Uh, he bring, Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, brings about a religious reform. Um, he cleanses the temple and he says, let's turn back to God. He also receives envoys from Merodach Baladan, who is the king of Babylon. Uh, he shows them all through you know, the temple and his palace. And Isaiah says, you really shouldn't have done that because one of these days they're probably going to be back. Uh, but Hezekiah finds himself in revolt against Assyria. Uh, the same Assyria that had just recently taken the northern kingdom of Israel into captivity. Now, to prepare for that, uh, one of the interesting things about which we read, both in the Bible, and this has been found in archaeology, is that he extends a tunnel underneath the city of Jerusalem to bring water inside the city. Here's a... Uh, uh, sort of a chart that shows the extent of that tunnel uh, and notice in, in our chart it sort of winds it does wind I've been through that tunnel uh, and it does wind its way from the pool of Gihon there's a natural spring on the on the north side on the right side of our drawing here all the way to the pool of Siloam uh, at the southernmost part of the old city of Jerusalem you can go through that tunnel today. You can walk through it. Notice we're my, my guide and I are we're standing in water as we walk through the tunnel. Uh, it's a very long walk. You want to make sure in, a place, in places the, the roof is, is almost hitting your head. Uh, in, in other places it's, it's uh, maybe you know, 25 feet high. Uh, you come to the end. Um, my brother took this picture just a couple of years ago. Uh, and there's an inscription. Now, what you're seeing here isn't the original inscription. They, uh, the Turks took it out and they transported it. You have to go to the museum in Istanbul, the Antiquities Museum there, to see it. But now uh, they have put a facsimile, uh, uh, sort of a representation of what that original inscription looked like. And it tells the same story that's found in Second Kings, only it's from the worker's point of view. It's a, a delightful um, first-hand account of those who dug the, tum the tunnel, Hezekiah's tunnel. We read in the scriptures, sure enough, the Assyrians came down and encircled the city of Jerusalem. In fact, they captured most of the cities of, of, of Judah. Um, but then it happened that night that the angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when men rose early in the morning, behold, all of them were dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria departed and returned home and lived at Nineveh. He doesn't live a long time. Ultimately, he's assassinated by two of his own sons. But we do have Sennacherib's account of this same story. And it is a telling account because he speaks of all those that he's conquered. In each, each case, he comes and he says, and I, I caught this king and flayed him alive and chopped his head off and put his body on display. And I did this, all these things to that king and the other king. And he gets finally to Hezekiah. As for Hezekiah the Jew, who did not submit to my yoke, 46 of his strong-walled cities, as well as their smaller cities in their neighborhoods, which were without number, by Escalade and bringing uh, up siege engines. I, I captured all these cities. And then Hezekiah himself... Like a caged bird, I shut up in Jerusalem his royal city. In other words, I conquered all of these other pe people. I cut off their heads. I flayed their skins. And when it ca came unto to Hezekiah, I surrounded him. Which 
notice he doesn't say, and I lost 185,000 of my soldiers. Because, because the Syrian kings never told of their own defeats. It's interesting that I got a chance to see the same thing. Um, my wife and I were watching uh, the desert storm, you know, when the Americans invaded uh, Iraq. We were watching the news crews who were embedded there in Baghdad. Uh, and there we saw on the television, uh, it was a live report, and the news crews were, were speaking to the Iraqi minister of news, or just called minister of propaganda, who was announcing the American forces have all died in the desert and the Iraqis had won the war. And all of a sudden you hear somebody ask, what's that? And the camera's actually, they were, they were filming outside, the camera's just moved from his face down the street. You can see American tanks rolling into the city. And you can hear him saying, don't look at that, we won the war. <laughs> uh, they always lied about their their defeats, never talking about their defeats, and this is about as close as they could come. Well, uh, I can't say that I killed Hezekiah because he's still down there. Well, I surrounded him. The reforms that had been brought about by Hezekiah did not last beyond his son and his grandson, but it now comes to Josiah, who once again begins a reform, calls for the cleansing of the temple. In doing so, they find a copy of the scriptures, perhaps people think maybe a copy of the book of Deuteronomy, that had been all but forgotten, and it's brought before Josiah, and they read it, and he says, my goodness, we have sinned against that, and, and, and uh, they, they turn back to the Lord and begin again seeking to follow the law. And God says, because of that, because of that reform, Josiah, uh, you will see prosperity and Jerusalem will not fall as long as you are alive. And he, he reigns for some 40 years or so. Um, however, it's toward the end of his life that we see Assyria and the capital city of Assyria, Nineveh, falling to outside forces. A coalition of Babylon and the Medes, I put the Scythians up here, but they're not really part of the coalition. They're just doing their own thing. They're, they're attacking on their own. Um, but this attack comes, and the city of Nineveh falls in the year 612 B.C. From here, uh, the, the forces of Babylon, led by the king of Babylon here, was Nabopolassar, but his son, the crown prince Nebuchadnezzar, continues to the west, coming to Carchemish. Nature abhors a vacuum, it is said, and so uh, the question is up, who's going to be the new ruler of the world? And Nebuchadnezzar is thinking, well, I'm a good candidate, my father and I, uh, and he's moving to Carchemish. And meanwhile, in Egypt, there's a new king upon the throne in Egypt, Pharaoh Necho II, and he goes up to meet uh, Nebuchadnezzar at Carchemish. But to get there, he has to go through Megiddo, and Megiddo, remember there's no more northern kingdom of Israel, but Megiddo is, is sort of owned and operated by the kingdom of Judah, by Josiah. And Josiah meets the Pharaoh at Megiddo. And Josiah, here's another king of, of the Jews, of Jerusalem, who dies at Megiddo. So again, Megiddo is going to become sort of a byword. Now when we see Megiddo, today you're used to probably hearing uh, that city that is referred to the Mount Megiddo in the book of Revelation. Uh, the way you say mountain is Har, so Har Megiddo, or we shorten it sometimes to Armageddon. Um, and it becomes a picture of a great battle and of a great either victory or defeat, depending on whose side you're on. Um, but this epic battle now takes place in Carchemish between Egypt and and Babylon, and Egypt loses, and so the big winner of this is going to be Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. His father's still alive at this point, uh, but that won't be the case for long. And Nebuchadnezzar now comes down chasing Egypt all the way down to Cana and to, uh, to Judah. And now, the kingdom of Judah comes under the sway of Babylon. 
we have three de different deportations that take place when when Nebuchadnezzar first comes and captures Jerusalem um, in the year 605 BC. He takes some hostages, some certain sons of the nobility are taken away to Babylon like Daniel and his three friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, and that's more for Israel, for Judah's um, good behavior. Um, these you know, these these hostages are not going to be treated poorly. They'll be raised in the palace of the king, uh, and they'll be raised up to good, be good Babylonians. And the idea is that maybe if things go right, we'll bring them back, and they can be the future governors and and rulers of Judah, who will all be loyal to Babylon. But that doesn't things don't go well, and instead the Jews revolt against Babylon. And so Nebuchadnezzar comes back in the year 597 BC, and a second deportation takes place. This time, uh, Nebuchadnezzar takes 10,000 men of valor, the craftsmen, the smiths, including the prophet Ezekiel. And so Ezekiel is writing most of his prophecy, uh, you know, in Mesopotamia by a canal, uh, sort of a subject section near Babylon uh, called Keber. Uh, and Ezekiel's there in that second deportation. Uh, Jeremiah, meanwhile, is, is saying uh, to the Jews, follow the Lord, don't rebel against Nebuchadnezzar. God put him in power. They do not listen. And there's a third revolt, and Nebuchadnezzar comes back a third time in 586 BC this time. The temple is destroyed, and the general population is deported to Babylon, and only the very poorest of the poor are left in the land. We read in 2 Kings 25, 9, And he burned, that is, Nebuchadnezzar burned the house of the Lord, the king's house, all the houses of Jerusalem, even every great house he burned with fire. The walls of the city are torn down, and Judah as a nation ceases to exist. Now, uh, I've been telling you the story primarily from the perspective of the books of First and Second Kings. But I want to speak just for a moment about the books of First and Second Chronicles, because they give a parallel story, that many of the same events, but from a slightly different perspective. In Kings, we have the prophetic perspective, sort of looking at, at the judgments of God. In Chronicles, there is that same story, but it's from a priestly perspective. Uh, there's hope throughout. Uh, in Kings, the wars are prominent. In Chronicles, the temple is prominent. In fact, the way I usually tell my students is this. Uh, in First in and Second Kings, you're, especially once we have the divided kingdom, uh, we're going back and forth. First the northern kingdom, and then the southern kingdom, back to the northern kingdom, back to the southern kingdom. In the book of Chronicles, the camera never leaves the temple. Whatever you can see from the steps of the temple largely is what you see in First and Second Chronicles. It's the temple perspective. In Kings, it's the history of thrones. In Chronicles, it's the history of the Davidic line because that's who's reigning from the area, from where you can see, from the temple down in, in Judah. In Kings, the, we, we go back and forth between Israel and Judah. In Chronicles, it's mostly the, king, the southern kingdom of Judah. And now that comes to an end, although in the book of Chronicles, we have two or three verses right at the end that, sa that, this, that remind us after the Babylonian captivity, they eventually come back into the land. So that, again, it even ends with that, with that quality of hope. Kings is about morality. Chronicles is about redemption. And so now we enter into this period of the Babylonian captivity... But we'll pick, and we're going to pick up that thread, but first we're going to go back and look at the whole story of Mesopotamia.